Thanks, Jan, for the uh, invitation, and Nicholas, I should say. It's a particular pleasure to be here, and a, a particular pleasure to be involved in this seminar series on uh, law, capitalism, and democracy, and, and uh, in such illustrious company as the other speakers in the series. Um, let me introduce the, the title. Uh, the title is Lineages of Authoritarian Liberalism, and I added a, a sneaky subtitle for the uh, slides, Diagnosing the Conjuncture. And so I want to say a little bit about the, the, the terms before I um, begin. And I'm going to start actually with <laughs> diagnosing the conjuncture rather than authoritarian liberalism. So what am I doing? I'm diagnosing something. I'm not going to prescribe uh, uh, an answer uh, to, to all of our problems. Uh, the, the, the idea of authoritarian liberalism is diagnostic. It's an attempt to better understand where we are. The conjuncture is a term, it's something of a term of art within critical studies and Marxism in particular, and it suggests a period, a critical period, wherein a number of counterposing forces are coming up against each other. Capitalism and democracy, perhaps, uh, to take the, 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 the recent heuristic of Wolfgang Streich as being an obvious example. But the conjuncture is interesting because it reveals, it reveals the nature of the beast. The crisis reveals the, the underlying health, or, or not, as the case may be, of the patient. So the conjunctural moment is significant because it exposes contradictions. Now, authoritarian liberalism is an abstract term, and I'm going to talk about it within a particular time and space. The, the time, um, and I'll, I'll say more about this as we go on, it's a conjunctural phenomenon. It's, in other words, it's a phenomenon that reveals itself in the critical moment, and in particular, I'm thinking of the recent uh, uh, the decade since the financial crisis of 2008. Um, uh, but it also uh, has a lo much longer story. And what I'm interested in uh, here is trying to tell something of this longer narrative, a narrative which goes right back to the interwar period. It has a space. What I'm talking about is uh, in relation to a particular governing order, the governing order of Europe. Now, that's not to say that... Um, this doesn't have wider resonance, and indeed, uh, the current conjuncture, a lot of things are put together. Think about Brexit and Trump, often lazily put together, but put together nonetheless. And a lot of these phenomenon, or the, the elements of this phenomenon, are broader. They, they reach beyond Europe, but my focus is on, on Europe. Not necessarily the European Union, and I'll say something about how the European Union fits into this picture, but it's a, it's a time and a place. Um, now, I will say a little bit about uh, what the terms mean in, more particular, in a more particular sense. Uh, these are not really definitions, but we might say working, working hypotheses. Um, the, the, the way in which I'm working through this idea is not in the style of analytical philosophy. Um, or normative political theory. So definitions are looser, but I want to give you a, a definition just so we know roughly what we're talking about. Because when I talk about authoritarian liberalism, there are occasionally one of two responses. There are those who say it's, it's an oxymoron. <laughs> liberalism can't be authoritarian. And I've had this response uh, from some readers of my work. On the other hand, there are those, particularly in the Marxist tradition, who say, of course, of course liberalism is authoritarian. Give me, give me an instance of one liberal that's not an authoritarian. And actually, it's actually quite hard. I, I, I immediately thought of John Stuart Mill, but when we think about his relationship, for example, to imperialism, 19th century liberalism is tied, you know, tied up with imperialism and, pa and paternalism and all sorts of things. It's actually quite hard. So what, what, do, what are we talking about? Well, I mean by authoritarian liberalism a combination of political authoritarianism and economic liberalism. That's the two things, the two phenomena that come together. And that, of course, invites further question. What do I mean by uh, political authoritarianism? I mean by political authoritarianism uh, a, a regime which is non-democratic. 
So I can contrasting authoritarianism with democracy. And one way in which to think about this is to say that the authoritarian regime is a regime based on hierarchy. Whereas the democratic regime, uh, if we think about even the, the very roots of the term democracy, it's about political equality, the, the, the power of the demos. And that gives us one uh, angle of contrast. The economic liberalism uh, part of the equation can be contrasted with socialism. And, of course, this is a long story, but we might take, for example, um, the contrast between uh, uh, an economy based on competition with one based on solidarity. There are various other ways we could draw the contrast. But I'm not, at least in this stage of the project, I'm not um, so much interested in, the, in, in defending the concepts as such, but using them to show how historically they have evolved into something that we can describe as authoritarian uh, liberalism. Okay, so this is my very bad uh, infographic. This is why academics should uh, never try and sell things. Um, <laughs> I've sketched out the two um, uh, uh, poles, as it were, the spectrum of, uh, firstly, in terms of the first uh, part of the equation, democracy, uh, as opposed to authoritarianism. And, and I, I present it as a, a spectrum rather than a binary. We can imagine various forms of political uh, theory fitting in closer to the democratic side of the spectrum or closer to the, to the authoritarian side. We might think of certain forms of republicanism, uh, uh, which depend on uh, a theory of freedom as non-domination, as being more demanding politically than classical liberalism. We might think on, on one side of radical democracy as, as an even more, uh, perhaps the most demanding uh, uh, form or regime in which democracy has to extend into the workplace, into uh, uh, the economy. And on the other hand, we have authoritarianism, um, uh, where uh, there is a clear hierarchy, there is a hierarchical regime, and there is a, a governance by a set of institutions which are often um, exempt deliberately from democratic control. And we can draw a similar contrast between socialism and liberalism, and we could plot various ideologies, uh, across the spectrum from social democracy through to order liberalism and maybe neoliberalism as uh, being the most uh, uh, liberal, economically liberal uh, fr uh, 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 from a uh, political economy perspective. But of course these, these uh, two parts of the, uh, of the equation are not uh, entirely separable <laughs> and the point of putting to them together is to say that a regime has to have uh, elements of both. And we could, of course, imagine democratic liberalism or, or authoritarian socialism. Um, but if we have, if my diagnosis is right about authoritarian liberalism, and hopefully by the end I will convince you that it is, we would have the uh, contrast between democratic socialism and authoritarian liberalism. So that's sort of a rough conceptual mapping of uh, the, uh, the, the, the concept of authoritarian uh, liberalism. And we can come back to that in question, uh, question and answer if we like, but I'm not going to uh, go through it in any more detail. I would just make perhaps the final point by way of introduction uh, is to say that this is not necessarily um, uh, new or original. And there's been a, a lot of work done in political theory, in particular from the tradition of radical democracy, which is upfront about the divide between liberalism and democracy. This is a quote from uh, an article by the American political theorist associated with the radical democratic tradition, Sheldon Wolin. And this, uh, this is a quote from an, uh, a review article uh, on John Rawls's uh, book, Political Liberalism, uh, published in the 1990s. And Wolin in this article is explicit that the liberal tradition and the democratic tradition are entirely separate. And indeed, not only are they separate, but they're antagonistic. Liberalism and democracy should not be thought of as the same thing or even in the same family of traditions. They are very distinct projects. 
He says, democracy should not depend on elites making a one-time gift to the demos of a pre-designed framework of equal rights. Rights in a democracy depend on the demos winning them, extending them substantively, and in the process acquiring experience of the political, that is, of participating in power, reflecting on the consequences of, of its exercise and struggling to sort out the common well-being amid cultural differences and socioeconomic disparities. Wolin's critique then, uh, to, 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 to summarise it, is of the depoliticizing tendencies in liberalism. Liberalism tends to depoliticize in various ways, through, for example, uh, the very discourse of uh, rights uh, in, in this example. So it's not necessarily uh, that new, but I maybe just want to make the point so we know uh, where, where we're going. Okay, the conjuncture. The idea of the conjuncture, as I said at the start, is that it is a period in which various contradictions or tensions rise to the surface. There is a, a, a way of presenting this as a periodic crisis of capitalism. But I look at it slightly differently, without necessarily denying that capitalism has this inherent capacity to self-destruct, as it were. My sense is that the contradictions lie not only within capitalism as an economic system, but within what I would call the material layers of the constitution. In other words, the reason that the, pr the last decade has thrown up all of these critical periods and, of course, these um, monstrosities <laughs> uh, is that there are tensions not only within the economy but between, for example, the various layers of the material constitution, the institutions of representative democracy, the social relations within which any constitution uh, is, uh, on top of which any constitution is built, uh, the political objectives that are served by a particular uh, constitution. Now, if we accept that the last 10 years since the financial crisis has thrown up these contradictions, these tensions, these critical periods, one way of analysing them is to say they respond to a norm versus exception uh, analogy. So, liberal democracy in its normal period, runs relatively smoothly. Once in a while, for whatever reason, crises emerge. And in the sort of liberal account, they're exogenous. They're not, in, crises are not endogenous to the system. They're exogenous. They're as a result of external forces. But we go through periods that require exceptional moments of response. So in the crisis period, Emergency measures become necessary, whether that's bypassing the normal institutions of liberal democracy, parliaments, courts, even through executive measures. But that ultimately these series of responses are exceptional and are intended to return to a normal situation. And initially I had some uh, sympathy with that position and I could see my own analysis of the euro crisis which I'll come to in a moment as corresponding to that type of analysis but as uh, I thought about it more and more it struck me that the norm exception uh, model doesn't really do justice to what's going on and that what is uh, revealed <laughs> through the crisis period uh, deeper structural problems within liberalism itself. And so the thesis, this has been a, a long introduction <laughs> to, a, to a thesis, the thesis is that post-war Europe is reconstructed on the basis of what we might call a soft authoritarian liberalism. In other words, the authoritarianism that has emerged in the crisis period is not exceptional, but is rather a, a deepening of 
a set of uh, internal problems which long predate the financial crisis and indeed uh, can be uh, understood as emerging out of the post-war settlement itself. Okay, so that's the end of the introduction. Now we're going to begin with the present, or the last, the, the last decade, and um, just pick up on a, a couple of events, incidents, during the Euro crisis, out of which a lot has been written uh, by academics in various disciplines. This is Mario Draghi, uh, <coughs> president of the European Central Bank, who was uh, credited in 2012 um, with rescuing the euro. This was the height of the uh, euro crisis period in the wake of the collapse of Lehman Brothers in 2008 and the revelation of the deficit as being higher than it had previously been thought. Um, and it became clear at this point that something drastic needed to be done in order to rescue the euro. And uh, Mario Draghi um, gives a speech in London in July 2012. Within our mandate, the ECB is ready to do whatever it takes to preserve the euro. And believe me, it will be enough. And you believe uh, uh, an Italian uh, man when he says that. <laughs> And by all accounts, it was a pretty spectacular um, uh, announcement. It has been described as one of the most successful or important announcements a central bank has ever made. The ECB pro announces the OMT program to buy unlimited bonds of mem member states in financial difficulties on the secondary markets. And um, as a result of this promise, the markets are calmed and the euro is saved. Now, there are various constitutional challenges to uh, OMT and, of course, other, um, other aspects of the Euro response, which I won't go into, but ESM uh, especially. There are various challenges to these programs, uh, particularly in the German Constitutional Court. These programs are unconstitutional, they're ultra-virus, they are uh, 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 exceptional acts which are not justified by the circumstances. Um, the ECJ green lights them despite the uh, dubious uh, credentials in order to preserve the euro. So this is the, the sort of classic idea of the exceptional moment justifying a, uh, a measure which may be of dubious legitimacy but is necessary in order to preserve the long run um, uh, status quo. The second um, uh, event, incident, uh, uh, which you may recall. This was during the uh, Greek crisis of 2015 when uh, Alexis uh, Tsipras, uh, Prime Minister of Greece, had been elected in 2015 on an anti-austerity platform. The Syriza party uh, won the election and then had to negotiate with the Eurogroup and the Troika uh, uh, the terms of the bailout. This is a, a well-rehearsed story of austerity being imposed on debtor countries, not only Greece, but Portugal, uh, and uh, in different ways, Spain and um, Italy and Portugal have, uh, and Ireland have also been uh, uh, affected. Now, in one sense, this looks exceptional. Of course, this was the, the famous hashtag that went around on Twitter. I'm not on Twitter, incidentally but I, I, I do have friends that are. <laughs> uh, this was a, uh, the, the hashtag that went round when um, Chipras was negotiating the conditions with the Eurogroup. Um, this is a coup, it was described as a coup uh, to, to capture the sense that what was being done was overturning a, a democratically elected government, in effect, by uh, uh, forcing uh, a set of um, conditions which went entirely against the program on which they had been elected. On the other hand, if we, if we look at the nature of the, the measures, the, the austerity, the conditionality, they are all based on market rationality, this deepening 
of market rationality. And in that sense, they are not exceptional at all, but follow the normal run of the project of market integration. They're also conservative in aim. The, uh, uh, the, the, the goal of the, both the ESM, the OMT, and the conditionality uh, measures themselves are intended to conserve a project. They're intended to conserve the project of the euro and indeed of European integration itself. And finally, in, in order to kind of contrast uh, uh, the sense of imposition, because of course imposed is in um, uh, uh, quotation marks because no one forced anyone to accept anything. If we accept uh, uh, the narrative of uh, uh, the possibility of exit from the EU, and we'll come back to that at the end, I won't talk too much about Brexit, but I will mention it at the end, then we can say that this is not imposed at all. This is accepted, maybe reluctantly, but there's no, um, there's no authoritarianism in that sense, in the sense of coercion, at least in the sense of a coercion that has no alternative. There is always an alternative. That, however, misses what's going on here. And the idea of um, uh, leaving the EU is simply unimaginable. I mean, we can see now uh, with a, a country um, such as the UK how difficult it is to leave the EU. We can imagine how much that would be magnified in relation to Greece. Lapovitsas, the Greek uh, uh, political economist and member of, of the, a former member of Syriza, has a term which captures, I think, better what is going on, and that is this idea of the fetish of the EU. Membership of the EU is so deeply ingrained in the constitutional imagination that one cannot imagine an alternative. It has become fetishized in the same way that uh, Marx spoke of the commodity fetishism. Okay, so two um, different episodes, and people will interpret these episodes in different ways. But we have to go back, <laughs> because in order to make sense of these episodes, and we could add many others, in order to make sense of these episodes, we have to go back in time. The immediate circumstances of the last decade uh, will not explain what's going on sufficiently. This is a quote from Karl Marx from the 18th Brumaire. Men make their own history, but under circumstances existing already, given and transmitted from the past. The tradition of all dead generations weighs like a nightmare on the brains of the living. Um, incidentally, the, the, the 18th Brumaire, uh, Louis Bonaparte, the nephew of Napoleon Bonaparte, could, I think, uh, well be characterised as an authoritarian liberal. Um, but my sense on interpreting the Euro crisis is that the present is not enough. We need, as Marx suggested, to consider the tradition of the dead generations that are weighing like a nightmare on the brains of the living. So, this involves going back at, at least to the interwar period. In fact, it, it requires going back um, before the interwar period even to understand why the interwar period was itself a conjuncture, a critical period. Breaking this narrative, which begins with the French Revolution, 1789, continuing until the First World War. And of course this is a, an enormous topic, but if we take um, uh, Hobsbawm's trilogy of books which capture the long 19th century, beginning with the Age of Revolution, French and American revolutions, which are the birth of the autonomy of the political, the Age of Capital, which uh, involves 
the separation of political and economic, uh, and of course the advent of mass democracy, the march of the masses onto the stage of history as Hobbes Baum describes it, and a third factor which is imperialism, that the material contradictions of capitalism are displaced through imperial adventures. Now, it's important to get a sense of this backstory, at least in outline, in order to see why the interwar period is so crucial. This um, is a cover of an uh, edited collection of um, uh, authors on the uh, interwar collapse of the Weimar regime in, in uh, Germany and focuses um, on a number of authors, but three, I think, make perhaps most uh, significant for our purposes, Hermann Heller, Hans Kelsen, and Carl Schmitt. The interwar period is significant precisely because it calls into question the very foundations of, modern, of the modern state, which were laid out by the long through the long 19th century. And I want to pick up on um, Hermann Heller's diagnosis, because it's where the term authoritarian liberalism comes from. And in fact, it was this revelation <laughs> that made me think when, when, when my own diagnosis of, of, of the Euro crisis phase as being this, reflecting this combination of political authoritarianism and economic liberalism, it has a much longer trajectory. And it turns out that Hermann Heller um, used the phrase to capture the period before the Nazis came to power before the Nazis seized power in January 1933. This brief phase in between 1930 and 1932 of uh, what is sometimes called the cabinets of the, the barons under President von Hindenburg. Heller, Hermann Heller, a German um, constitutional theorist and member of the Social Democratic Party of Germany, identifies this period as an odd one. <laughs> this is a period of deep political turbulence. It of course also follows the, um, uh, the Wall Street crash and the beginnings of the Great Depression. Heller uses the term authoritarian liberalism to capture what is happening in that uh, uh, significant period, a period that, for example, Karl Polanyi describes as using uh, in, 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 in the same um, terms as Heller as being the group the authoritarian liberals, the clique that, in Polanyi's word, put Hitler into power. Heller uses the term authoritarian liberalism uh, pejoratively, so he's using it to diagnose the situation, but he's also using it to critique the existing uh, government under, under Hindenburg. Heller used the term authoritarian liberalism pejoratively, attacking it as an opportunistic position which justified a strong state in order to manage and maintain a liberal market economy and the capitalist interests that sustained it, subsidizing large banks and industry with one hand while dismantling social policy with the other. So we get a sense here of the, uh, the two terms coming together, political authoritarianism. This was a regime which bypassed the uh, uh, German parliament, which used executive decrees and diktats in order to maintain a liberal market economy and the capitalist interest that sustained it, but in an opportunistic way, in a way which clearly advanced the interests of capital. And uh, in, in Heller's analysis, this is a, uh, a, a dangerous um, um, form. It's a dangerous form of government. Heller himself uh, already uh, in 1928, so even before authoritarian liberalism emerges, recognises the fragility of the regime and argues that actually democracy requires some kind of relative socio-economic equality in order to survive. That's, that's his own uh, diagnosis. The authoritarian liberals, however, tried everything in their power to prevent that from occurring, at least from occurring through a route to democratic socialism or even through social democracy. 
But Heller was not only attacking the uh, regime, he was also attacking the theorist who was advising the regime, Carl Schmitt, who um, is described by Heller as an authoritarian liberal. And this is interesting because uh, Schmidt is almost always uh, immediately identified by theorists as a, an anti-liberal or as a critique, a critic of liberalism. But in Heller's view, and indeed this has been picked up by other authors, from a different perspective, Schmidt was a liberal, was an authoritarian liberal. What, what Schmidt objected to, at least at this stage, of course Schmidt goes through various stages, but at this stage what Schmidt objected to was the weakness of liberalism, not, not economic liberalism as such. What, Sch what Schmidt found problematic was liberalism's weakness of heart, as it were, its weak philosophy, its weak state. It wasn't, as, it wasn't, the liberal, uh, it wasn't economic liberalism that Schmidt objected to. This is picked up by Renato Christi. Um, if liberalism were to restrict its apoliticism to the sphere of civil society, to the economy, and acknowledge the necessity of a sovereign state that retained the monopoly of the political, Sch Schmidt would not object to conservative authoritarian liberalism. Conservative liberalism was sometimes used um, in this period to, to describe the same thing as authoritarian liberalism, uh, uh, an attempt to maintain the free market against the forces, particularly on the left, that were threatening it. Okay, Schmidt is important because of the way we reinterpret this period in the post-war period. If we look at the, uh, uh, the period, at least until uh, 1933, the reason Schmidt thought that the state needed to be more authoritarian was to defend the Weimar Constitution not to overthrow it, and in particular those aspects of the Weimar Constitution that protected the bourgeois order, private property and the uh, market economy. And at this point, Schmidt was actually in favour until, of course, he, he eventually joined the Nazi party, but at this stage he was um, uh, advocating for banning both the Communist Party and both the KPD and the NSDAP, uh, um, precisely in a way that would later be taken up by scholars uh, under the influence of Löwenstein as militant democracy. And of course in the 50s the German Constitutional Court does precisely this, it bans both the Communist Party and the neo-Nazi uh, Reich Party. In the intervening period, um, Schmidt, who does go through various changes in his philosophical um, um, uh, justifications, in the concrete, the phase of the concrete order of uh, thinking, which comes in between his defense of uh, 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 the use of emergency powers under Article 48, uh, in, the, in, in the intervening period, in a 1932 address to the uh, German uh, Industrialist Association, the Langnamverein, Schmidt makes it clear that the enemies, and in fact not only the uh, extremist parties who were suspected of wanting to overthrow the Weimar regime, but even those who wanted to deepen democracy into the economy, um, which was a part of the uh, Weimar constitution, and in particular as developed by the labor lawyers uh, Franz Neumann and Hugo Sinsheimer. Reading that address, which is appendix to Christie's um, book, becomes clear that for Schmidt, the enemy are those who want to intervene in the economy in order to, to democratize it. And of course, this is a period at which there were strong arguments from workers' councils, not only trade unions, but workers' councils, revolutionary councils even, to take control of the workplace and the economy itself. The strong state, Schmidt said, needs to prevent that from happening. The strong state needs to distance itself from the economy. And this, of course, is taken up um, uh, by the order liberals uh, in the post-war period. Okay, I'll have to move a bit more quickly because I want to make sure I get at least nearly to the end. Um, so, 
I've already mentioned uh, uh, the uh, notion of militant democracy, which is associated not with <laughs> uh, Karl Schmidt, but usually with um, Karl Lovenstein, although there, there have now been, I think, um, uh, many, uh, uh, much research which shows that, that the idea really originates with, um, with Schmidt. Um, I do want to say a little bit more about how the reaction to the breakdown of uh, Weimar, and indeed the breakdown of liberal democracy more generally in, in the interwar period, gets um, interpreted by the uh, mainstream liberal uh, uh, democratic institutions and theorists. And so I pick up instead on uh, Jan Werner Muller, who in his book Contesting Democracy describes the post-war period now as restrained democracy, um, in part in reaction to what was perceived to have been an excessive uh, uh, democratic fervour in the interwar period. Um, as I said, as I maybe impl implied, that's a misdiagnosis, at least in part, because it neglects the crisis of capitalism. But nevertheless, whether it's a, whether it's a, a misdiagnosis or a diagnosis, there is a sense that this becomes the dominant way of understanding the post-war constitutional order. Democracy must be stabilised to avoid excesses. Um, in political terms, Christian democracy is extremely important in its dominance, both domestically uh, in um, France, uh, Germany and Italy, but also in, its, in the influence of Christian Democrats on the project of European integration. The building of counter-majoritarian institutions, again, both domestically and in uh, uh, the regional order of Europe, um, constitutional courts, central banks, human rights conventions, the European institutions, all of which can be understood in some way as part of this bigger project of restraining democracy. Um, Christoph Muller's, in what is maybe a more lucid explanation of this phenomenon, uh, or maybe a more candid explanation of this phenomenon, says, well, yes, it is based on a fear of the people. It is based on a fear of democracy. Um, and his uh, chapter to this collection is entitled, We Are, in brackets, Afraid of the People. That's the way that he captures the story of German um, constitutional history in the 20th century. A series of attempts to tame the democratic um, uh, impulse. And of course this has a huge impact in uh, constitutional theory more generally through the notion of the tyranny of the majority and all sorts of other um, inventions. My own interpretation is a slightly different one. I think militant democracy is a complete misnomer because it means the opposite of what it suggests. It doesn't mean a militant or vibrant democracy at all. It means a restrained democracy. But a restrained democracy is also something of a mis misnomer because of Muller's story, um, this is really a fear of democracy. This is a really a, a fear of the masses. But it's not only a fear by the elites of the people, it's also a fear by the people of themselves, the turn away from democracy. This is Eric Fromm's um, uh, Escape from Freedom, who tries to capture the modern man's turn away from freedom as a result of his turn away from responsibility. This is simply too much. There is another story which we could tell, a very similar story, um, again, based on this idea of a repression or a suppression of democracy, which explains the building of uh, institutions and, and, and indeed a culture of depoliticization through a turn to technocracy, experts, managerialism, and uh, a, a view of the individual person no longer as an active citizen, but as a passive consumer. And this um, is a, a, also a story that has been well told. I illustrate here with uh, Marcuse's One Dimensional Man. This is not a period of a vibrant republicanism. That's to the, 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 
the, the short version of the story. It's been described as a move from active to passive constituent power. In particular, once a constitution is set in stone, or at least part of it is set in stone as a rigid, even unamendable constitution, such as the German constitution, um, the German post-war constitution with its eternity clause, the attempt is to do away with the idea of constituent power entirely. The power to make a new constitution is forgotten. Constituent power, to put it differently, becomes passive, to quote Alexander Somek. This has institutional implications. So that there's the culture, but there's also the institution building. The demise of parliaments. This is a story that has been well uh, documented. And indeed, it's not a recent phenomenon. We can find plenty of research from the 1960s and 1970s which tells precisely this story. The legislature no longer has a priv privileged position in this new constitutional order. It has a material dimension. This is the uh, uh, aspect of ordo liberalism, which picks up um, where we left off uh, an interpretation of the interwar breakdown as being one in which the free market was not defended with the proper legal institutions. So as opposed to Hayek's idea of a spontaneous market order, the order liberals believed that the market required ordinal. Um, now, the order liberal story is important to tell because it is a more sophisticated one than the usual story of neoliberalism and because of its impact on European integration. So the order liberal story um, is different from the neoliberal story because it was different in part and similar in part and it's important to get both the differences and the similarities. The order liberal democracy needs to be restrained, democracy can be irrational, Democracy interfering the, in the economy can be irrational, but capitalism can also be irrational. So the order liberals are aware of this twin problem from their point of view. Capitalism needs to be restrained as well as democracy. So you need strong um, legal institutions in order to protect the market order. The market order doesn't protect itself. An unfettered market leads to its own destruction through monopolies and cartels. So it's sometimes presented as this sort of third way. Um, but what we can say about order liberalism is that it has a, uh, as an ideology, it does not promote democracy in the way that we might think of as um, part of a, a tradition of, democracy, of, of radical democracy or republicanism or even political liberalism. Um, this is a quote from an early diagnosis of order liberalism going back to 1955. Um, Karl Joachim Friedrich presents order liberalism, he calls it the new liberalism, uses the term neoliberalism to describe German order liberalism, a long time of course before we think of uh, the neoliberal era. Order liberals do not see democracy in their perspective. There is a general tendency to confuse constitutional democracy with the anarchic majoritarian democracy that the Jacobins read into Rousseau and to see totalitarian dictatorship as its inescapable fruit. In other words, democracy is dangerous not only because it's irrational, but because of what it can lead to. It can lead to, uh, in, in this Jacobin, uh, uh, Jacobinian um, perspective, it can lead to uh, totalitarianism, and so needs to be uh, restrained, it needs to be kept in its place. Foucault in 1979, his lectures on governmentality, picks up this story again a long time before most others, and identifies both order and neoliberalism as representing a similar phenomenon, the reversal of the political and the economic. In other words, whereas in our story of the long 19th century, beginning with the French and American revolutions, the political is foundational, in this post-war era, the economic becomes foundational and the economy is depoliticized. In other words, although there are important differences between the two uh, 
ideologies between order liberalism and neoliberalism, particularly on the role of the state in managing capitalism, there is also a profound similarity, and that is a scepticism of democracy, a scepticism of socialism, and indeed a scepticism of any form of centralised economic planning that is not in itself intended to prom promote economic liberalism. Individual economic freedom becomes the legitimating device for the whole constitutional order. And the combination of these uh, two uh, uh, things, order liberalism and neoliberalism, combine to, um, to form an idea, a new idea, an economic constitutionalism. And the idea of the economic constitution is that the constitution is there to protect the market from democracy. So it's the reversal of what uh, Neumann and Sinsheimer had imagined by the economic constitution. They had imagined an, econ econ an, an economic constitution to be a constitution that democratised the economy. Now the meaning is reversed. The economic constitution is intended to protect the market from democracy. In other words, to keep democracy out. Deep through de depoliticisation of the economy, whether that's through the turn to experts, technocrats, and indeed, as we'll see in a moment, international institutions, or whether that's the uh, uh, attempt to abolish class conflict from the political domain. Okay, the, the, the next part of the story that we have to include, although I'm aware that I'm getting close to, to the end, we do have to include another, another um, angle, and that's the globalization of order liberalism. Um, order goes global, and, in, and indeed uh, a recent book by uh, Quinn Slobodian entitled, entitled Globalists um, explains this uh, move. He traces it back to the Geneva School, which is associated in part with the Freiburg School of Order Liberals, and how um, um, they turn this uh, encasement of the market economy into a international phenomenon. Um, this is actually a quote from uh, Jaya Surya, uh, who explains the reversal, the same reversal that Foucault had identified um, uh, uh, between political constitutionalism and economic <coughs> uh, constitutionalism. I won't read the quote out, uh, apart from the fact that we're running out of time, I'm also running out of uh, voice. <laughs> um, but I do want to read this quote out, because it brings us full circle. The order liberals have a clear conception of the political ramifications of notions of economic constitutionalism. Echoing Schmidt, Boykin argued that by the end of the 19th century, the state was increasingly captured by private interest groups. This led to the politicization of the economy which in turn weakened the state. That, of course, was Schmidt's precise problem with the liberalism of his period. In other words, the main purpose of economic constitutionalism was to protect the economy from these political pressures. This could not be but authoritarian. OK. We can do the rest pretty quickly, um, because I haven't said yet much about the role of European integration in this. It is significant, and I'm not telling the story of global, auto-globalism, but I am telling the story of European uh, post-war reconstruction. We can see in the European economic community, and indeed in the ECHR, although I won't talk about the ECHR, but we can see in the Treaty of Rome, right from the beginning, right from 1957, this attempt <coughs> to separate the political from the economic, now at the level of the regional order of Europe. In other words, a European market can be um, protected from the democracy that is exercised at the level of the nation. Even Gian Domenico Mioni, who is certainly uh, no um, left-wing radical, identifies this as being at the root of the uh, Treaty of Rome. Fritz Sharp has analysed in painstaking detail how 
through the constitutionalization of the Treaty of Rome by the ECJ. There has uh, uh, been a deregulatory bias, as he calls it, pushing in the direction of further market in, uh, integration. Joseph Weiler uh, speaks of the political messianism of the founding period, beca precisely because democracy could not be part of the DNA, as he calls it, of European integration. Hicks and Follesdahl identify the democratic deficit and free market bias of the um, um, European legal order. And this is all long before the uh, decade, the last decade's uh, financial crisis. In other words, all of the elements, all of the elements of authoritarian liberalism are in place long before the turn to the exceptional measures that we've witnessed through the last decade. Okay. Now, why then has this settlement endured? I mean, authoritarian li liberalism doesn't sound like a very sellable product. So why, why has it endured? Why has it um, been maintained? It's clear that in Europe, we're not talking about a pure form of auto globalism. For one thing, most obviously, Europe is not the globe. Europe has borders just as the nation state does. Europe has, well, the project of European integration has been accompanied by this discourse of post nationalism and post sovereignty, but at the same time, always achieved support by promising something to come. Whether that was the federalism to come of the founding period that never materialized or the constitutionalism to come that still attracts many to its cause. We have, we have pretty much got to the end because the, uh, the end is not now, <laughs> but the end is the present. And it seems that this order, despite its um, problems, and despite its lack of uh, support, is still holding firm. We have witnessed now various backlashes to authoritarian liberalism. These are sometimes dismissed by liberals as populist. But if we think about what's going on in the terms of authoritarian liberalism, we can see it as a quite predictable attempt by the demos to reclaim power, to reclaim sovereignty. And of course, in conditions of inequality, which are not far off what Heller was witnessing in the interwar period, it's not surprising that alternatives are sought. That's Varoufakis. Um, but I want to end with Roderick's trilemma. And this is the, the last point I want to raise before I, before I conclude. Roderick's trilemma, although is problematic, I think, in many respects, is a helpful way of understanding both the post-war uh, period, uh, but also the period he describes as neoliberal, the period of hyper-globalization, and also now the difficulty in a period of crisis of maintaining this triangle. And he says in his this is why it's a trilemma. You could only have two of these, but not three. You can have two, but not three. That's why it's a trilemma. You can have national sovereignty and hyperglobalization, but you have to abandon democracy, which is effectively the path that we've taken. You can try and democratize globalization itself, which re requires some form of global governance, or you can revert back to national sovereignty and democracy, which most people think is atavistic. To, return, to attempt to return to a, a golden age which never existed. I've tried to apply this to, uh, yeah, this is the last slide. I got to the end. I've tried to apply Roderick's trilemma to uh, the current situation. And it's helpful to some extent, because if we think about this conjunction of political authoritarianism and economic liberalism, in fact, what, what he calls... Um, the 
golden straight jacket. Uh, Snell calls it also the golden uh, uh, straight jacket, but thinks that it only, ref uh, only captures the crisis period EMU. I think this actually captures pretty nicely the um, uh, uh, phenomena of authoritarian liberalism. What then are the alternatives, if there are any, to the present conjuncture? There is, of course, um, the Varoufakis DM movement, also supported by philosophically by Jürgen Habermas, which is to democratize European integration. Then there's the attempt, as it were, to recover the two um, bottom uh, uh, poles of the triangle, corners of the triangle, national sovereignty and democracy. Um, this, is, this is the curious position um, of a Brexit stroke Lexit, a uh, left-wing exit from the European Union. In fact, the way Brexit is, is going, if it goes at all, <laughs> isn't, a rupture, uh, uh, isn't a rupture from the system, but is in fact simply its deepening, its continuation, because the conservative Brexit, as it were, is simply a, uh, uh, an attempt to exaggerate the combination of national sovereignty and economic integration at the global level. If there were a rupture, it would either be Lexit or um, um, DM. Um, so that's the, the future of authoritarian liberalism, or perhaps the alternative futures to authoritarian liberalism. And on that, I will conclude. Thank you very much. So would you call yourself a promoter or believer in authoritarian liberalism in all aspects? Shall I answer? Yeah. Okay, uh, no. <laughs> so <laughs> <laughs> I should have... Elaborate <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Maybe I should have made it more clear from the start. Um, I'm, I'm trying to understand... The start, sorry. Okay, okay. Um, it's a diagnosis. Okay. Um, Personally, I, uh, I, I don't find it a particularly uh, pleasant uh, conjunction in which to, uh, to operate, because I'm, my own views are uh, uh, certainly democracy and um, socialism sounds like a, like a great thing. Um, so, no, I'm, I'm trying to use the term authoritarian liberalism to understand where we are and where we've, where we've come from. And it's, it's in fact, in, if anything, it's... It's meant uh, pejoratively uh, as a critique oh, yeah. of the existing. Uh, but don't, don't you think you could diagnose it also with authoritarian conservatism, coming from America like a wave over Europe and not really pushed back by China, Russia, or, <laughs> or kingdoms <coughs> in the Middle East? Uh, authoritarian conservatism, I mean, the, well, the, the reason that um, the, the, the liberalism part is important is to capture the, both the practice and the ideology of economic liberalism, which has been driving both the project of European integration, but also the post-war project of ordo liberalism. So I think if we, if, if we use the term authoritarian conservatism, we don't capture the material element, uh, which is, is this deepening of market integration and indeed the depoliticization of the economy. All right. I'm done. Uh, well, thank you for this. Uh, it's uh, very uh, rich. Um, I, I have, there are so many things that one could say and pick up on that, you know, it's hard to know where to begin. So I'll just begin, you know, at one end. Yeah. And um, so I think one would need to look more, I mean, I'm, I'm sure I'm not telling you something you don't know, but just, there are, I, I think one would need to look how that breaks down across different, you know, different national trajectories. Uh, you know, if I zoom in on what you said about the Weimar period, it, you know, it's also important to keep in mind that the Weimar period was in the context of German political history an outlier. If you go back to the 19th century, the, the, the idea of the monarchy principle from Stahl, all German liberalism was was only ever authoritarian. You say that so you know the what what, what the Nazi you know said so what fascism, Nazi you know communism did, 
political totalitarianism was to bypass parliament. Well, parliament in Germany was never anything, it was always a Staatsorgan, never a Volksorgan. And I'm sure you know the word by Schoenberg on this. So, so it, it's really, at least in Germany, liberalism is only ever imposed from above. And of course, that, break, that, you know, that looks differently if you look to France. Uh, but I think there are important ways in which that sort of you need that needs to be kept in mind that this is not only conjunctural, uh, and this goes back much further. I mean, again, you did more than hint at this, but this goes back further than the post-war settlement. Uh, that the the idea of an authoritarian liberalism, I think, has is much more intimately bound up with liberalism than than that would allow. If we go back to some of the moves that you, uh, you know, that, that you map out, we find already an early sovereignty thinking. The, the idea that, of the, you know, the, the people, you know, the, the, essentially the idea of the individual as a consumer rather than a citizen, we find that in Hobbes. We even, the same argument, interestingly, you know, we, we can trace back to Aristotle, that people would rather plot their you know, cultivate their little plot of land than to, than to vote in the assembly. Both Hobbes and, uh, and Aristotle make that point, which is essentially to say that people are not first and foremost political beings. They are first and foremost sentient beings and hence given to hedonism and consumption. So I, I think that it's um, that there are ways in which the theoretical context of liberalism I think offers correctives to a reading that departs from what is a contingent or conjunctural phenomenon, which is the economic crisis. Um, I don't know, so, you know, yes, I suppose that's the gist of it. Do you want to ask that? Yeah, yeah, no, that, that's, that, um, I, don't, I don't disagree uh, with any of that, actually. That's also quite helpful. Um, Maybe just split the points into two. Yeah, yeah I think that's um, useful. Th so the, the, the first point actually might be helpful to go to the uh, slide from, whoops, where is it? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm holding it upside down, that's why it was, it was going forwards and I thought it was going backwards, but I had, I had the, the thing upside down. Um, yeah. Where is the uh, s slide for? It's the one from um, Friedrich on, oh yes, uh, Ordo. Um, yeah, so when Friedrich in 1955 diagnoses order liberalism, he says this is quite remarkable because he points out precisely what you just pointed out, which is that liberalism has been so weak in Germany, exactly in the way you, you described. And he already finds it astonishing that in, in, in a relatively short space of time, Liberalism has come out with this new uh, uh, strength in Germany, in post-war Germany, and really um, picks up on, on the peculiarity of it. And in some ways, uh, I think you're right. There is a peculiarly German story here which is driving the narrative. And, and I think implicit in your question is, is it justifiable to take that very particular story of liberalism in Germany and to expand it into uh, a, 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 a broader story? Um, and I acknowledge, I acknowledge the, the difficulties, but I do think that, in particular, the way that the German experience has influenced not only the, um, what we might call the core founding states of the EU, so the founding six. So Italy, we could tell a similar, a similar but different story about Italy and its interwar breakdown, France, um, of course, the, the Benelux countries, which experienced German fascism because of... Uh, their proximity um, to Germany, that each of these countries um, has um, uh, uh, either indirectly or directly <coughs> experienced uh, the post, uh, the, the, sorry, the fascist uh, 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 breakdown and also therefore can be <coughs> described in some ways as post-fascist constitutions. I think this is the, 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 the term that Senior uses to give this um, an ideal type. <laughs> and I think uh, there is something to that, and we might want to distinguish, for example, that ideal type 
from the parliamentary uh, liberal democracies of Scandinavia and the UK and say that they form a different type. And then the um, post-Soviet breakdown accession countries to the EU probably also have a very different experience. And I think that's absolutely right. And, and some of this, of course, is uh, when we're dealing with ideal types, we are simplifying. But I do think that the, the German narrative has had a particular dominance in both the literature on constitutional theory, perhaps unfortunately, <laughs> but nevertheless it has had that dominance in the literature and indeed on the institution building itself. Um, um, so yes and no. Yes, I, th I agree the German story is particular, but I don't think it's unjustified to say that it has had a particularly profound impact on post-war um, uh, reconstruction. I even in another paper, provocatively call this the, the new German ideology. Um, second point, I think I also agree that, and in fact it's grist to my mill, that authoritarian, that, sorry, that liberalism has always been authoritarian, going back to Hobbes, and Hobbes, I suppose, would be the obvious starting point here for an, analy an, an analysis along those lines. Um, that would be the, the next... So the next book <laughs> is to trace this story back to the long 19th century and to think about the development of liberalism in the 19th century as an authoritarian phenomenon. So I don't disagree. But then, of course, it's, the onus is on me to show why the post-war liberalism is different. And I think I can show that precisely because it's in the interwar period when democracy makes itself felt in a way that it was not felt in the 19th century. And that's because of the, the universal franchise. That's because of the uh, emergence of a strong working class consciousness of, of course, the Bolshevik Revolution on the, uh, to, the, you know, to the east of, of Germany, which is also Schmidt's fear. At least his explicit fear is that Germany will, uh, uh, that the, the, the socialism leads inevitably to something like um, uh, Soviet dictatorship. So I think there is a particular a particularity about the way liberalism is reconstructed in the post-war period in direct fear of democracy in a way that wasn't there in the 19th century. And that's because of the interwar conjuncture. Well, if I could just say one thing. To, well, I, I think that sounds, very, uh, that sounds very interesting and very promising. I, I would probably tend to think that either... Well, you're at sort of at the fork in the road, I would say. You either have... It's either... It's not... A mystery that that European ideology has been so successful because, in a sense, it's just it's just more of the same because it's it is what we always had, um, and so one mystery falls by the wayside. Or, in the alternative, you end up misrepresenting what liberalism was because there was indeed a time, and if you are going to trace it all the way back to Hobbes, you see that right thinking was the original depoliticization is directed at liberalism, is directed at rights thinking. That is what sovereignty needs to somehow get a handle on, because rights thinking is, that's of course what the natural laws are doing, that's the work they're doing in, the sort of, in that sort of, uh, in, in Hobbes' work, is exactly to nullify the threat <coughs> of rights thinking, because rights thinking would, is generative of political conflict. So uh, either you, uh, you know, uh, I, I, I'd be interested to see how that sort of, you know, pans out. But, but it, it seems either you're giving short, short shrift to liberalism or you end up, uh, or, or both, or you end up sort of really not having a mystery as to why Europe has been, European ideology has been so successful because essentially it's just, a, it's just more of what we, we've always had. Okay, yes, well, yes and no, but in, in a sense, I don't want to spend no, too long, but that, 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 um, in a sense, the, 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 the end of the, of the narrative is to suggest that authoritarian liberalism isn't quite as stable um, as one might have thought. So I want to also kind of explain something of its, uh, of its weakness, but, but, I, but I take your point. Right, we have to see it. next on the list. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much, Mike. Um, I wanted to ask you about um, social democracy and how you see that fitting into the story because I could see, on the basis of your lecture today, I could see 
social democracy as a manifestation of authoritarian liberalism. In, in one sense, I, I think social democracy, especially how it came to, to be manifested in, in the Scandinavian countries, as what Schmidt would call um, a qualitatively totalitarian state. So it's a state that could control everything, but that consciously steps away from something. So it protects the market, um, but still uh, grants a lot of um, uh, rights. So also sort of controls the market in a way. So so that leads to, to the other way of looking at it, which would be saying that um, the way social democracy um, came to be in these countries, um, I mean, we basically have the most equal socially and political countries in, in, in human history. So in that sense, they would belong more to the both the socialism axis and the, the democracy axis. <coughs> so I'm just wondering how you, well, you would see this as part of the story or as sort of like um, a counter, counter movement using Poland's yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, that's a that's a it's a great question, and it's it's one that um, I've had to think through because it it's an objection. I mean, you didn't you didn't necessarily ref you didn't necessarily phrase it as an objection to the thesis, but it has been uh, uh, raised as an objection. Um, my way of reading the story of the relative success, perhaps, of social democracy in uh, the post-war period in some places, and maybe Scandinavia might be a nice example of that, is that it doesn't, um, it certainly doesn't conform to the, uh, the hard-edged authoritarian liberalism um, um, in, in the way that uh, 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 Schmidt would have understood it. Although I think it is important to acknowledge that there is a difference between democratic socialism, which, th which, which that wasn't, <laughs> and social democracy um, in the way you've described it. So one of the puzzles uh, raised by the story is, well, how do we explain what Piketty refers to as the, the Trente Glorias, or the, uh, the, the glorious... Uh, golden age, as the uh, American and British uh, political economists talk about this 1945 to 1975, uh, when it seemed as if in, in the long run of things, um, there was a relative equalizing of conditions, the building of the welfare state, um, um, relative equality between uh, the classes. Um, Piketty suggests in his through his statistical analysis, so this is an exceptional period in capitalism over the centuries, and that since the 1970s, at some point, we've returned to the normal run of things, which is um, growing inequality. Now, it depends how we interpret that golden age. So one of the factors which we would have to include into the story is, of course, the destruction caused by the Second World War. That equalizes conditions in a way which is perhaps even more significant than the building of social democracy. But in any event, I don't see, um, I, I would see the, the influence, or certainly on, on European integration, of Christian democracy as being greater than social democracy. And even in those places where we could uh, uh, identify a role that social democracy is playing in equalizing conditions, I think I would agree with you, at least implicitly, that that's not a form of, um, uh, through a form of radical democracy. <laughs> it's very much in line with the authoritarian elements of authoritarian liberalism. It's managerial, it's technocratic, it's corporatist, it's involving unions, yes, but not in the sense that Sinsheimer and Neumann understood. It's not council democracy or revolutionary workers' councils mm -hmm. who are doing this work. It's a uh, 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 well, in in the in the uh, view of um, um, uh, Gindig and uh, on his book on making of global capitalism, this is explained as a way of maintaining um, capitalism itself. That there was understood in the post-war period, 
maybe, in, maybe analogous to the way the order liberals understood that capitalism needed to be constrained, that, the, that inequality uh, too needed to be constrained, but not in a way that promoted uh, a, 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 a vibrant or active uh, democratic citizenry. So I think it, I think it is uh, perhaps um, uh, a, a slightly different phenomenon from authoritarianism but liberalism, but I think it's one that can be integrated into the narrative without threatening the, the major uh, thesis. So, Nicholas? Yeah, yeah, thanks a lot for a very in interesting and rich talk. I tend to agree with, the, with most of it. So just some small footnotes and perhaps a question. Just picking up from, from Anand, I think, I think the relation between uh, liberalism and democracy is it's quite complex and you get many different combinations, at least in the 20th century, where democracy becomes a buzzword. Um, yeah, Helena Rosenblatt wrote a very good book on this recently, of course, uh, earlier this year. For sure, those you write about and those Quinn Slobodian writes about, they are anti-democratic in the sense that what most of in, in here tend to associate with democracy, our ideal type, uh, parliamentarism, majority voting, equality, they're against that. But I think it's not part of your story, it's not part of Quinn's story, but I think overall if we have to understand why, you said why does this endure, why it's been successful, I think it's because to speak with Jan Man and Müller, they have contested democracy. It's not that they are against democracy, they have a reinterpretation of democracy. It's market democracy. It's participation on the market to be free to buy and sell and all that. I think that's quite important. Going back to, uh, let's say, Quinn would probably agree that neoliberalism began in the interwar period. You would think that <coughs> most of these people, except some of the order liberals, they have a positive notion of another. They even talk about economic democracy, the real economic democracy, Ludwig von Mises, is the market democracy. That's just to throw in a footnote. That's not part of your story, but I think it's important anyway. So coming back to Jan Werner Müller, I, th I think even though, uh, if I understood you correctly, you criticize him, I think the interpretations are quite similar. It's a constrained democracy. So the question is, coming back to the first question, that you're quite critical, and I guess in his book, he's actually endorsing mm -hmm. the constrained democracy. And it would be interesting to see him write a sequel, because if you look at it today, after the crisis, I mean, I would like to see how he defends how the EU have acted since then, but for him it's a normative defense. But you would agree with him that it's something that's in the system, that it's, if not authoritarian, then constrained. But my question would just be, for you, just a matter of clarification, when, of, of course you have roots, but when does it change, does it, does it these deep contradictions, is that in the crisis? Or is it, to speak with Piketty, something that begins already in the 70s? J just to clarify your interpretation, when does it kick in? When does what kick in? This exactly? authoritarian uh, liberalism. Uh, liberalism kick in. I mean, somehow it functioned okay, according to Piketty, at least with equality as a present. Now it doesn't anymore. Since the 70s, it's gone down. But is the chronology in the 70s? Is it after the Euro crisis? That's the question. Mm -hmm. And just one last one uh, to, to, to throw in, and that is um, authoritarian liberalism, yes. But, but if you look at somehow one could say, if you look also at a national level, let's say if you go to Denmark and you look at how uh, uh, decisions are being made. So they take, we're going to do something about the welfare state about education, anything. They take a bunch of economists, they go in and they measure efficiency. And they have a notion of uh, microeconomics that's compatible with economic liberalism. But are they authoritarian liberals or are they somehow, is it a managerial strategy? Does it make sense? Do they know what they're doing? That it's actually built on anti-democratic foundations, does it make sense what I'm saying? I mean, of course you have these deep strands, I don't disagree with that, but I think a lot of the people who are actually affecting this, they don't have any clue. They, they, it's the economic necessity, but they, they somehow disconnect to any kind of, you know, 
anti-majority voting and insulated from the massing in case India comes. They don't know anything about that. They're just trained economists. And it so happens that it just fits in nicely with authoritarian liberalism. So just some footnotes and, and comments. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, thanks. Thanks. Um, yeah, uh, great um, questions again. So I think there's probably three, three things there. You can pick and choose. I can pick and choose. Yeah. Um, ah, yes, yeah, the first thing, Jan, Jan Werner Muller. So um, this is important, I think. Where, where are we? Where is Muller? Um, yeah. Muller. Yeah, so it, it's interesting because um, in Jan Werner Muller's book, Contesting Democracy, that you refer to, there's no reference to order liberalism. I double checked this, it's extraordinary. It's extraordinary. It's, he goes into minute detail in the, chrono cr you know, the chronologies and tracing the, the Mont Pelerin society and the road through from the you know, influence when Hayek returns in the 70s. There's no mention of order liberalism. In a, sim in a similar time, he'd written. Um, uh, a, a piece in the London Review of Books reflecting on the Euro crisis and says order, liber liber order liberalism is so ingrained in the German mind that there's no chance of any other uh, response to the Euro crisis than the one which imposes austerity and so on. And th th this is not written too far apart, but it's interesting that in this story that he tells about restrained democracy, order liberalism doesn't feature. Very strange. Um, now, He traces the institutional developments, um, the role of Christian democracy, and that's coming back to Senior's question, is far more important in his narrative than, 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 than social democracy. Um, um, but yes, I, I, th I think the term restrained democracy is problematic for exactly the reasons you uh, identified. Um, Muller wants to, in some way, uh, justify this arrangement. And, uh, and when I first started reading the book, I assumed that it was going to be a critique. It wasn't. And as I, said, I found myself, it was sort of a cognitive dissonance in reading the book, because it is a great book. But it struck me, I was at the end of it, I wasn't quite sure why, what, he was, what he was doing, or why he was defending this term. And for me, democracy, and here I am, in, uh, uh, influenced by the radical Democrats, Restrained democracy is a, uh, an oxymoron. <laughs> democracy is about the passions. It's about an active citizenry. It's about struggle, material struggle. And it always has been. So restrained democracy, to me, is a, a misnomer. Um, the second point about the, the, the timing of um, the change. And yes, most... Most uh, um, stories of post-war European integration present, in a similar way to Piketty, or at least analogous to his timeline, that there is this golden age, and then in the neoliberal period something happens. Capital revolts, uh, seeks um, uh, cheaper markets. Uh, the unions are defeated by Thatcher and Reagan, and of course Mitron's uh, uh, attempt at a social democratic program is reversed through the financial fear of the financial markets and so on. So you have these, this building up of pressure um, leading up to the Treaty of Maastricht, which then founds you know, the constitution of EMU with all of the order liberal and neoliberal implications that come with that. But my, what, I, what I want to suggest is that, that a period of neoliberalism, of what is usually called neoliberalism, is not a departure, but is a deepening. And so I want to reject the narrative of um, authoritarian liberalism as, as coming out of neoliberalism, uh, let alone just coming out of the recent decade of response to the financial crisis. I do want to suggest a more linear narrative, one which goes right back to the post-war period. Um, and in that sense, I... I, I, I would distinguish my, uh, my analysis from, for example, uh, Chris Bickerton, who also uh, very much identifies neoliberalism as being the, 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 the key uh, shift. The third, third point about, that's a really good question about um, are, are the kind of managerial types 
uh, who indulge in this, really authoritarian, when they don't have this overview of what they're doing at all. It's kind of mathematical. Yeah. It's, part of, you know, it's part of the, the turn of the discipline of economics to um, uh, a, a much more um, soulless discipline, <laughs> I would say, to use a, a pejorative <laughs> term. And abs that, that's a very interesting part of the narrative which I didn't tell. And you're right, um, it's, it is an important part of this narrative of the isolation of the economics discipline from, uh, from society, from uh, political economy. Um, so yes, thank, thank, thanks for bringing that up. In answer to your specific question, I think yes, it is authoritarian in the sense that my use of authoritarian, or what I call at the beginning soft authoritarianism, doesn't depend upon a, uh, a, 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 a someone wielding an iron fist. It can as much be that that the people themselves are, are as a result of their own fear of freedom, looking for. Uh, the elites to rule over them. It's not necessarily that the elites are ruling with an iron fist. Although the iron fist, I mean, we can identify the iron fist now and again when the going gets tough. But, it, but my understanding of authoritarianism is as this phenomenon which has this more, yes, yeah, psychological dimension, a paternalistic. Um, um, uh, uh, the, that's why I referred even, although in passing to, to Marcuse and from the Frankfurt School, I think the early Frankfurt School grasped this that the post-war period was not one in which there was this vibrant democratic life. And of course, we can think about the revolutions of 68 as personifying that reaction to authority. Um, but thanks for your questions. All right, so I also will allow myself to put a question and then I'll have shy and because you've had already one shot, then we'll see if that. I hope we'll have time for it. It concerns the dilemma and the approach your use of uh, Roderick's mm. concept. And I was quite puzzled already when I was reading this uh, globalization paradox. Mm. Because is it really true that what is the place of national sovereignty as, a, as opposed to economic integration and democracy? Because you can also say that sovereignty is in a way only instrumental to democracy. So you need to have some sort of political unit within which you can make democratic decisions. Mm. But in itself, what is the value of sovereignty if it doesn't serve democracy so that we have this sort of unit? Mm -hmm. And at the same time, there is something missing in this triangle. And there I would prefer to Hizikso. And we've had a short email exchange about her work and her different sorts of dilemma. And that's individual freedom, which is not really captured by this triangle. So in a way, you can say you have a conflict. One would be economic prosperity, output, effectiveness, whatever you may call it, then you have this collective freedom translated as democracy, and then the third is rights, individual freedom. Wouldn't that be a, like, a true trilemma, rather than, to me, what at least represents a false trilemma, because I don't really see sovereignty as a value which can stand in itself, as opposed to, on the one hand, economic integration or economic prosperity, or democracy. Okay, so let's go to Roderick's trilemma, um, which, yeah, I, well, we can go to, maybe we'll go to my version of Roderick's trilemma because, <laughs> of course, it's, it's, it's not quite the same when we start thinking about the European Union. Um, the, the top part of the triangle is not the same as hyperglobalization. Um, <laughs> so, and of course, one, would, one might want to point out that if we democratize European integration, what we end up with is a, is a national sovereignty raised to the level of the European Union. So we have European sovereignty. So um, I, I agree that the, that the trilemma is not um, quite as neat, uh, certainly when applied to the European Union, uh, as, uh, as, as, uh, as one might think. On the question of, of national well, so in your question, I think your question was more why sovereignty matters in any... Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, it does matter, but yeah. not in the same way as democracy or, or economic prosperity or economic integration, which again serves economic prosperity because integration in itself is also not a goal. Yeah. It serves something else. Okay. Um, so 
Well, I, I'm not sure I would necessarily agree that we can just uh, associate economic integration with prosperity, because precisely um, uh, for the reason that we, we need to introduce some kind of uh, class analysis, right? Some people have benefited this more than others. I mean, this is this is the, the quote that I skipped over from Varoufakis, mm -hmm. uh, probably very similar. So this is this is um, Donald in response to Donald Tusk, who tweets, "I've been wondering what that special place in hell looks like for those who promoted Brexit, without even a sketch of a plan how to carry it out safely," and um, Varoufakis replies. Probably very similar to the place reserved for those who designed a monetary union without a proper banking union, and once the banking crisis hit, transferred cynically the banker's gigantic losses onto the shoulders, shoulders of the weakest taxpayers. Now, of course, that's just rhetoric in some way, but, but it's important rhetoric because Varoufakis picks up on this point of um, uh, the losses and gains. The losses and gains are not simply uh, Germany versus Greece. The losses and gains are class-specific. Um, which is why any talk about either globalization as simply about prosperity um, is always going to miss important features of how that uh, is redistributed or not, <laughs> as the case may be. Um, yeah, so it makes, I think, to have sovereignty even more sort of misleading or ideological, if you want, because it allows you to oversee all these in intrastate, class, and other divisions. Yeah, yeah. Right. So the same, yeah, the same with national sovereignty. When we talk about the national interest, it is always, to some extent, uh, a, a, conceal, a concealer of the interests that are winning and losing out of a particular circumstance. Um, but I think we can, we, well, we, couldn't, we can talk about sovereignty phenomenologically as the autonomy of the political realm, the capacity to in Schmittian terms, to decide, which is why, um, strictly speaking, sovereignty remains, because even for those members of the European Union who are subject to the um, uh, uh, conditionality, um, one can leave, one can default, one can um, at least formally leave leave the, the system, at least the system of European Union. Of course, one cannot leave the system of the global economy, at least without uh, <laughs> great difficulty. <laughs> um, so yes, it is something of a formal notion. Um, and it is distinct from democracy, certainly the way I, I understand democracy, democracy to be uh, a, a, a tradition of radical democracy, of gaining con well, I'm now going to use the, the, the Brexiteers' own slogan, regaining control <laughs> over the economy. Um, but that isn't what the uh, current path suggests, the current path uh, of uh, Brexit suggests. It's suggested by some on the, on the left, the Lexiteers, who want to regain democratic uh, 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 control of the economy at least in some uh, future uh, state. Um, so I'm not sure I quite got what you thought the relevance of, of uh, the other trilemma was in terms of individual rights, collective rights, and the third one I've forgotten. Uh, effectiveness. Effectiveness. Um, I, I would see, I mean, that might be a useful trilemma on the, at the level of values to, con to think about the potential conflict between uh, values. Um, but I'm working not so much at the level of values, but more at the level of material interests and material phenomenon. And, uh, and that's why I think Roderick's trilemma is a more useful one for explaining both the, the current predicament and the various um, responses to it. All right, so um, Mike is very generous with us because we are getting many lectures as answers to our questions. And I'm not yeah, to I just, just Well, I just want to throw into the debate. What and if then I would just ask Shai and... What if the operative term is not sovereignty but nationalism? Mm. That might, of course, you know, because I agree with, with Jan that on that 
on that exception, you sort of think, why not collapse sovereignty and democracy? But if the operative term is nationalism, it becomes essentially a matter of what's your group of brethren. Mm -hmm. Are you, is there, you know, one would be a matter of control where democracy is a stand in for sovereignty, or could be. And the other is essentially a matter of are there uh, self referential, self contained groups of reference, which would then sort of be the counterpoint to hyper globalization? Is this, you know, that might be a way to save the, save the triangle. All right, so I'll ask Shai directly to give this question. So the question is about the, the role of crisis or emergency in your analysis. And uh, there are, there are two, two questions. One is uh, descriptive and one is normative. They are connected, of course. So descriptively, what encourages this authoritarian tendency, this increasing uh, intervention of the state? So we have Hayek in the role of Serfdom, which says it's emergencies that created. And then it stays on, so it starts with an emergency and then uh, deteriorates from a democracy to a dictatorship. And we have others like Mark Austin who says, no, it's actually interest groups all the time try to uh, get more benefit from the country. So it's actually a routine, peaceful time that leads to more and more and more dimension that chokes economic uh, growth. That's the first question. What is crisis? I think it was asked also before. Is crisis necessary for analysis? Is it what causes the authoritarian tendencies? or the other way around. And the second question is, what should be the normative analysis how to treat the crisis? So we have Clinton also saying, because we know that things that happen during crisis have a tendency to corrupt the system from within and stay later on, let's make it as quick and uh, difficult as possible. So we make constitutional dictatorship, it's a different regime, it's a temporary regime that applies to it. <coughs> and others come from Israel, so there's always an emergency, so we try to make it as, as uh, close to a democracy as possible all the time. So you have a completely opposite tendencies, both from the descriptive part and the normative part. And I was wondering where you stand on these questions. Okay, so thanks. Um, so my original sense, when I was reflecting on this back in 2013, which was perhaps the height of the Euro crisis, um, the, the period just after which Mario Draghi had an, made his announcement. Um, it was seriously questioned whether this thing could hold together at all. And at that point, I thought that the norm exception uh, analogy was quite useful, to un at least to understand the predicament and the responses to the predicament because of course in some ways the crisis is not just the diagnosis of a crisis but the way one responds to the crisis and it seemed as if the governing uh, apparatus was finding it difficult to respond to the crisis partly because of the constraints which are built in the legal constraints the treaty constraints it turned out that those could be relatively easily circumvented when push came to shove and on second reflection or third reflection maybe it struck me that this was not really what was happening this wasn't a series of measures that were short or temporary aimed at restoration of a normal period of liberal democracy but to take for example the measures of the European Central Bank, they weren't measures which were intended to enable uh, uh, Greece or Italy to return to a normal functioning liberal democracy, but to return to market democracy. In other words, the, uh, the, the restrictions, the, res the restraints or the, 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 the suppression, if you like, was already there and it was a deepening uh, rather than a departure from the uh, trajectory of integration. So I came to the, the conclusion that although the crisis period is useful in uh, uh, revealing something about the norm, it's not, a, it's not a dichotomy of norm exception. I don't find that particularly uh, helpful. Now, in relation to the second question, normatively, what should one do 
um, about uh, the crisis. It's true that I, I, I don't really address that question directly. Um, if my diagnosis is correct, then the problems are much more deep-rooted. Um, and uh, the kind of uh, tinkering around the edges, whether it's with the uh, reform to the Eurozone, which hasn't really been reformed very much, or whether it's the kind of projects that are offered by the new authoritarian liberals, so Macron's European army, this isn't going to res resolve um, this much deeper uh, uh, problem or diagnosis uh, of authoritarian liberalism without something like a rupture, which is why um, I think the, uh, uh, the Brexit um, uh, is so significant. Um, because whatever else Brexit is, and it's many things, um, it was a moment of rupture from, a potential rupture, one should say, because we haven't, Britain hasn't left. It was a, but it was a, a moment of potential rupture from the dominant post-war understanding of uh, uh, the combination of um, uh, uh, the, the Roderick um, identifies between deep uh, economic integration or hyperglobalization and uh, national sovereignty, um, at least in at least potentially. Uh, so, in answer to the normative question, which I'm not really uh, dealing with here, my, my sense is that one would require um, a, uh, a pretty drastic uh, rupture from the pr present path in order to restore uh, a healthy functioning democratic system. Right, we have the last 10 minutes. We have one last question over there. And if I can squeeze in one later, then that's all right. Uh, right. Uh, I'm sorry? sorry? If I can squeeze in yeah, uh, one question later, then yeah, okay, yeah, all right. Let's do it. Yeah. So let's do two questions together, okay. starting with you. Yeah. Would, would you say that uh, authoritarian liberalism peaked in the 80s with Reagan and Thatcher and, and made the, I say, the idea that you could live for your own bought money and population <coughs> until it, it all collapsed this century? Second question. All right, I, I have a kind of different question. Uh, it's uh, uh, as I understood, uh, um, it's very interesting for me this idea of restricted democracy, and I believe that uh, the amount of restriction has to be equivalent to the amount of dissonance that there is in the society. Right? That there, there is a certain necessary cohesion of level of understanding things in agreement in order for democracy to be at all. So uh, I was uh, pretty, cu pretty um, uh, surprised that you haven't mentioned too much the, the noise that's happening, the, the manipulation, especially bringing up uh, Brexit, especially bringing up tweets, which are clear, uh, you know, manipulation and noise in working. So I, I would like to see what's your stance on that going right now and going further uh, in terms of manipulation and, and the restrictive democracy. Do you want me to yeah. answer? Um, so did it peak in the 1980s? Well, um, unfortunately not. <laughs> um, I mean, the Th Thatcher is a, an interesting story in, in its own right. So the, the fact that uh, British uh, neoliberalism was well, certainly in, in, in terms of neoliberalism um, we probably got there before before the rest of Europe which is one of the ironies of course of of the sort of Lexit position right this is the country that invented neoliberalism and now tr and now tries to um, present itself as a as a as a, a possible uh, antidote to European <laughs> neoliberalism um, no it, it, it deepens into the 90s and in many ways if we think about the turn of social dom democracy in the late 90s to the third way centrism, this is the, 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 the political component, what, what Tariq Ali calls extreme centrism, where it really becomes so uh, 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 in indistinguishable, parties in the centre right and the centre left, and of course that's led now to what social scientists call the pasokification of the centre left across Europe in reference to pasokification 
in reference to the Greek uh, party PASOK, which was the Greek uh, centre-left socialist party, the established party, which was wiped out. And we've seen that country after country, um, the centre-left established party has been wiped out in elections over the last few years, um, from France to um, Italy uh, to um, uh, Holland um, to other countries. It's, it's, a, it's a widespread um, um, phenomenon. And part of this, I think, is uh, this, the story of, of, of um, social democracy becoming <laughs> maybe authoritarian liberalism, to come back to the question which we, we had near the start about the role of social democracy in this. So thanks for, for bringing that up. I answered a slightly different question. But, um, the noise, the noise. Well, I mean, yes, of course, I, I chose a tweet which is noise, but um, uh, it's a tweet which raises a really important point, and I could have illustrated it with a more academic um, uh, quotation. Um, but I think... I think the, 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 more, the deeper point that you are getting at is uh, something which I only touched on at the edges, which is with populism. Um, I, I touched on it only on the edges because I think it's a, a, a topic on which too many people speak too freely. Um, and it's often simply used as a dismissal uh, of democratic phenomena that liberals happen to dislike. But it is significant that we are witnessing this uh, return of um, populist um, um, rhetoric, if that even is, in fact, the right way of diagnosing it. Um, and perhaps if we think about authoritarian liberalism, it can slip into something that looks like authoritarian illiberalism relatively easily. Because if the diagnosis is correct, that authoritarian liberalism hollows out, to use Peter Meyer's term, the, the democratic civic space. It hollows, it creates a void uh, where used to be political parties, the public sphere, and so on. If that's correct, then it's very easy to slip into um, a situation of um, populist appeals to the people who've been absent from the, 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 the scene as it were. Um, so yes, uh, that is, a, uh, I think, even explainable through this lens um, of authoritarian liberalism, um, and it could well be the flip side. Uh, uh, Chris Bickerton, who I mentioned earlier, even has coined a, a new term for this combination of technocracy and populism as technopopulism. Um, but what's interesting about the, the shift for example, in terms of the rise of populism in Central and Eastern Europe, is that it doesn't necessarily break from the dominant paradigm either of European integration or of neoliberal economics. Um, did you want to ask any more questions? So we are coming to an end, but if there is someone who wants to ask a question, we have five minutes. So it's really, if you want to go on Easter vacation or if you can postpone it for further five minutes. But if not, uh, first of all, before I thank to Mike, I want to announce there is going to be one last lecture in this series uh, this year, and that's on the 27th of May with David Creval from the Yale Law School. So if you are interested in this topic, he's coming to talk about uh, law and democracy in neoliberal times. So you can mark it in your diaries. And for now, just a big thank you to Mike, who gave us this great lecture and also a series of mini lectures in the answers. And of course, also for, to you that uh, you came and had uh, these questions. So thank you.